You know, I used to be a science teacher in the public schools in Australia. And one of the first science lessons I taught, one of the students said, Sir, you're a Christian. That's right. Well, you believe the Bible, but that can't be true. We know the Bible's not true. Uh, why is that? Because of what our textbooks teach us about ape men and about evolution. What I found was, when I was a teacher, that there were students in my classes in the public school who thought that they couldn't believe the Bible and they weren't prepared to listen to the message about Jesus Christ because their textbooks told them that they evolved and therefore, in their mind, the Bible wasn't true. And one of the things that I started to do then was to help them understand that evolution has not been proven by science and actually, when you understand observational science, it actually confirms the Bible's history. Have you ever heard this? Billions of years ago, there was an explosion in space, or 100,000 years ago, this happened or that happened, or even in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Question, how does anyone know? I mean, was anybody there to observe it? Well, actually somebody was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Check this out. First of all, we need to recognize that there is a huge difference between observational science and historical science. Both are valuable, but very different. Let's define the two real quick, shall we? Observational science is simply when we observe something and experiment to draw conclusions. It involves repeatable experimentation and observations in the present. It's through observational science that we find cures for diseases and build space shuttles, stuff like that. Now, through historical science, we consider things that happened in the past, but they cannot be checked in the same way. I mean, we don't have access to the past like we do the present because, well, it's gone, right? All we really have is speculation, or at best, circumstantial evidences of past events based on what we see in the present. That's not to say that we can't make intelligent guesses about the past or form reasonable inferences from rocks or fossils in the present, but we certainly cannot directly test our conclusions because we cannot repeat the past. Got it? So, does that mean historical science is unimportant? Not at all. Let's drop an example down here for a minute and take a look at the Eiffel Tower. You know, that 19th century Parisian monument designed by Gustave Eiffel that stands 1,063 feet tall, which was built as the entrance for the 1889 World's Fair and is still the tallest building in Paris today visited by millions of people in here? Yeah, that one. Well, guess what? Everything I just told you is true, but how do we test it? Well, applying observational science, we can, of course, observe the Eiffel Tower anytime we're in Paris. It's here in the present. Then, we can continue by testing the height and comparing it to all the other structures in Paris and confirm the claim that it is indeed the tallest building in Paris. But that's the extent of the kind of facts that can be proved by observational science in reference to this claim. How do we really know that Gustav designed it? How do we really know it was built in the 19th century as an entrance to the 1889 World's Fair? How do we really know how many people visited? That's all in the past. It can't be repeated. For that kind of information, we need to go outside the limits of observational science and discover what has been communicated to us through historical documents and eyewitness accounts. And furthermore, we have to believe those eyewitnesses and documents are trustworthy. The same is true when we talk about the origin of the Earth. The Earth is here. We all agree with that. So, does observational science confirm that the world was created by God? And are there trustworthy documents and eyewitness accounts that confirm it? Well, let's take the last part first. In short, what we're really asking is my original question, was anybody there to observe it? The answer is yes. God was there and he told us how he created. He inspired people to write down his very words that became books that were compiled into a complete book called the Bible, which has been verified over and over again and has demonstrated itself to be totally trustworthy in all it claims and teaches. Even secular scholars will concede that the Bible accurately records historical events. Anyway, we have the most trustworthy revelation from the most trustworthy eyewitness. Now, what about observational science? Does it confirm the Bible? Yes. And what's extremely important to realize is the observable fact that the universe is logical and orderly. That makes sense only if its creator is logical and has imposed order on his creation. It doesn't make sense at all if the universe is just an accident of a huge explosion. Also, our minds are able to comprehend many things about the universe, and that's only possible if the creator of the mind gave us the ability and desire to explore the universe. It doesn't make sense if our brains are byproducts of chance because we couldn't trust their conclusions to ever be accurate. And lastly, it only makes sense that we can observe and repeat an experiment if the universe consistently obeys the same laws from day to day, which only makes sense if a lawgiver created it that way and upholds it. So to be bluntly honest, science itself, whether observational or historical, is only possible because God exists and the Bible is true. I could go on, but enough said. And one of the verses of scripture that 
I've had at the forefront of my mind has been 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, always be prepared to give a defense or to give an answer. Uh, you know, I've been asked many questions over the years, like where did Cain get his wife? What about the races of people? How do you explain dinosaurs? What about carbon dating? What about the millions of years? What about the Big Bang? How do you explain the so-called races of people? How do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? Who's heard those sorts of questions? Have you heard those sorts of questions? Oh, yeah. Now, I can't go through all of them, but I'm going to through, go through a number of them to show you, as a Christian, we need to be able to give answers and defend our faith, and we can. And it's exciting because God's word is true. So let's start off with uh, the first question here. Is there any evidence for an infinite God? That's one of the questions I've been asked. How do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? And to answer this question, we're gonna start by looking at that molecule of heredity that I'm sure we're all familiar with called DNA. You know, the helical structure of DNA was first discovered by two scientists called Crick and Watson uh, back in 1953. Well, you know what, young people? We know today that scientists have studied a lot more about DNA, and we've found that DNA is not just chemistry. Let me explain that to you. Here is a rope that has beads on it, beads representing dots and dashes. By the way, those dots and dashes actually spell out a word. It's the word help. How do I know that? Well, you only know that if you know the Morse code. If you know the Morse code, if you know the language, then you know that those dots and dashes actually spell out a word. But those dots and dashes don't mean anything to you unless you have the language. DNA has these beads, molecules, lined up in a particular order to write all this information that builds a human or builds a dog or builds a cat or builds an elephant or whatever. For instance, you're made of trillions of cells and in nearly every one of your cells, you have all the information that builds you. It's been estimated if you were to type out all the information from one set of your genes, from one of your cells, it would fill, they used to say a thousand books, 500 pages each, close type written. Now they say it's much more than that. And here's the interesting thing. That information is not in the molecules. The molecules are arranged in a particular order to write the information. Just like when I open up my Bible and I can read it, but the information I'm reading is not in the molecules. The ink has been arranged into letters and into words and into sentences. And because I understand the language it's written in, that's where the information uh, really is. But here's the interesting thing. You've got to have a language to read the information. And DNA itself has the information that makes the language to read the information, that makes the language to read the information, that makes the language to read the information. You get the idea? In other words, you've got to have the information, but you've got to have the language. If you don't have the language, then you can't read the information. It's all got to be there or it won't work. It's all got to be there at the same time. And you know one of the things that we found out? Languages only ever come from an intelligence and information only ever comes from information. DNA cries out that there's an intelligence behind life. It couldn't have happened by chance random processes. Matter on its own could never produce DNA. But if life evolved, matter had to produce DNA. But that could never happen. I want you to watch one of these short videos we have from the Creation Museum that helps explain this a bit more. If you found an ancient clay tablet with strange characters washed up on the shore, you couldn't read it, unless someone had cracked the code. But you'd still know the letters represented a language, even if you didn't know anything else about the author or his civilization. Language is recognizable, even if you can't read it. Take Morse code. It has three basic parts, dots, dashes, and spaces. These three simple parts are combined to represent letters. There are 26 letters in the English language, which are combined to form over 400,000 words. Those words can, of course, be combined into an infinite number of sequences or sentences. There is evidence that DNA represents a language. Four basic units, called nucleotides, combine into a code for 20 amino acids. From those few amino acids, the body forms more than 100,000 proteins. Even if you can't read DNA, it still has all the hallmarks of language, a language that biologists are just now beginning to crack. Every tiny cell in our body is packed with three feet of DNA, three billion nucleotides. The similarity between DNA and human language is uncanny. 
in addition to codes, both use similar techniques to pack, access, rearrange, copy, and translate information. DNA seems to represent a language, the language of life. An unseen author, the creator of heaven and earth, has left a testimony of his existence in the DNA of every living thing. For those who believe in evolution, they believe that millions of years ago, somehow life had to arise from matter. As, as you think about that, it's not just a matter of saying life arose from matter. Life is built on DNA. You've got to have DNA to arise from matter. But not just DNA, you've got to have a language system. Matter produces a language system. Matter has to produce information. People who believe in evolution don't believe in God and people say matter gave rise to life. You've got to understand matter had to give rise to zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of bits of information. And over millions of years, information keeps coming from matter, new information to form all the different kinds of animals and plants, zillions of bits of information. You know what's interesting? We've never seen matter produce one bit of brand new information that never previously existed. Not even one bit. An information scientist, Dr. Werner Gitt, wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information. He's from Germany. And he makes these statements in that book. There is no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information. And he says this, a code system, in other words, a language, is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intel intelligent origin or inventor. DNA is a language system and an information system. It could not have come about from matter on its own. It's absolutely impossible. Now you might say to me, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, what do, what do the atheists say about that? What about those people who are scientists who don't believe in God? Don't they have an answer? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that question. I want to show you a video clip of an interview with Dr. Richard Dawkins. Who's heard of Dr. Dawkins? Dr. Richard Dawkins. Oh yeah, I think many of us heard of him. He wrote the book, The God Delusion. He's an atheist. He spends most of his life fighting against someone he doesn't even believe exists. A number of years ago, uh, we had someone who interviewed Dr. Dawkins to ask him this question. Dr. Dawkins, you know, he's an atheist. Can you give an example, we only wanted one, where matter produces information and adds it into the genes. By the way, if evolution is true, it had to happen zillions of times. We just want one example, just one. I want you to see how he answered the question. Watch this. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? There he is giving the right answer right now. Can you hear it? That is the right answer. There's no example. Now you might say, okay, okay, that was years ago. What does Dr. Dawkins say now? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that question too. How many of you have seen the movie called Expelled? Oh yeah, a lot of us have seen Expelled. I want to show you a video clip from that because here's Dr. Dawkins, uh, who many years after that video clip was asked the question, how did life arise on earth? What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of Do you know what he's talking about when he's talking about look at biochemistry and find a signature? He's talking about DNA. What, you know what he's really acknowledging? DNA cries out there's an intelligence behind the universe. He doesn't believe in God, so it had to be some intelligence from outer space that brought life to Earth. Let's go on. Biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but uh, that uh, higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. Well, there you have it. There's one of the leading atheists in the world giving you the evidence to support his faith that life evolved 
it came to earth from outer space. And think about that for a moment, by the way. Dr. Dawkins, how did life on Earth get here? Well, maybe some uh, civilization out there in outer space that it itself evolved had to bring life to Earth. So if you go back to that planet, wherever it is, and you said to him, well, how did life on this planet first come about? Well, I guess his answer would be, well, there was another planet out there somewhere where life evolved and they brought life to that planet, they brought it to this planet. Well, okay, let's go back to that planet now. Now, how did life come about on that planet? Well, there must have been another planet somewhere out there and life evolved. And he mocks at us for believing in an infinite creator God. Do you know what? It's the atheist that has a blind faith because the evidence does not confirm their faith. What we see in biochemistry confirms in the beginning God. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? It really is. Dr. Dawkins has a blind faith. As Christians, we don't have a blind faith. Students, don't get the idea that Christians have a blind faith. That's not a blind faith. Because if the Bible really is a revelation from God, and he's given us the true history here and where things came from and what life is all about, it'll make sense of the world. And it does. And science, true observational science, will confirm the Bible's history. And it does over and over again. But then how do we answer questions like this? I remember I was at one conference, a little boy, I think he was about seven years old, who came up to me and he said, Mr. Ham, yes, well, who made God? Oh, don't you just love those questions? And from a little boy like that, so how am I gonna answer that? So I looked at him and said, well, son, if somebody made God, that'd have to be a bigger God who made God. Would that be right? Well, yes, sir. Well, if you've got a bigger God who made God, then who made the bigger God? You have to have a bigger, bigger God who made the bigger God who made God, right? Oh, yes, sir. Well, who made the bigger, bigger God? You'd have to have a bigger, bigger, bigger God who made the bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God, right? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Do you know the only thing that makes sense, son? What's that, sir? You've got to have the biggest God of all, an infinite creator God. It's the only thing that makes logical sense. Young people, you learn at school about the laws of nature. Why are there laws that are the same today and tomorrow? If it's a random universe, it came about by random processes, why do we have the laws of nature? How can you trust them? Why do we have the laws of logic? If it's a random universe, why have the laws of logic? How do you know that your logic is the right logic, that it evolved the right way? How do, you, how, how do you know that you're really understanding somebody else the way you need to? See, the only thing that makes logical sense is a biblical God. In fact, Non-Christians and atheists like Richard Dawkins have to borrow from biblical principles to do their scientific research because he believes in the laws of nature and he believes in the laws of logic, which only makes sense in the context of a biblical God. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? Think about it. The Bible is true. God's word is true. Well, another question I'm often asked, how could Noah fit all the species of animals on the ark? Actually, the Bible doesn't say Noah took all the species of animals on the ark. The Bible, first of all, tells us that Noah was to take the land-dwelling air-breathing animals on the ark, not all the animals on earth, just the land animals. And secondly, it doesn't say species, it doesn't use the word species. Can anyone tell me what word it uses? Kind. You see, in Genesis chapter one, when God created the animals and plants, he says he created them after his kind, after their kind. The implication here is that each kind reproduces its own kind. In your biology classes, you study classification, phylum class, order, what's the next one? Family, genus, species. The Hebrew word for kind probably equates, in most instances, to what's called the family level of classification. When it comes to dogs, there's only one family of dogs, and they're called dogs. So there's only one kind of dog, and it's called dog. In other words, you'd expect to find uh, dogs reproducing dogs, cats reproducing cats, elephants reproducing elephants. Do you know what the secularists say about domestic dogs, for instance? They say the origin of the domestic dogs from wolves has been established, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. Even secularists would say that something like a wolf gave rise eventually to something like that. Poodles. People say, how could that give rise to that? Is that evolution? No, because evolution really should be more of, you know, adding new information. What we see here is an incredible loss of information, actually. Uh, actually, I want you to understand something here. 
If you're going to believe in evolution, like reptiles evolved into birds. Reptiles have the information for scales, but don't have information on how to build a feather, which is a very complex structure. So for evolution, you've got to have matter producing information with all the instructions on how to make a, a feather if a reptile was to evolve into a bird. But it's not just a feather, it's all the other uh, uh, characteristics as well. And so for evolution in the Darwinian sense, you need to see processes where you see new information being added, zillions of bits of new information added. Actually, what we observe is information being lost or rearranged, not information added. And let me help you understand that. We, we'll use dogs. We don't know how many go dogs God made originally, but let's say there were two dogs, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and eventually we end up with lots of dogs. Okay, you know, in genetics, we have a convention where we label genes with capital letters and small letters, big A, little A, big B, little B. So here's a male and female dog, and imagine something like wolves. And you get one set of genes from the male, one from the female. Here we have two big A's, two big B's, two big C's. And here are some different combinations. Now, as you look at that, I want you to notice something. Because these up here are dogs, th this is going to be what? A dog. It's going to look a little different to the parent. Why? It doesn't have any new information, but you know what it does have? It's got a different combination of information. You see that? It actually has less information than the parents. You know why it's got less information? It no longer has the little a's or the little b's or the little c's. It's actually got less information. This one here, this to me represents something like a poodle. See, if this represents a poodle, when you breed a poodle with a poodle, what are you going to get? Poodle, pretty sad, but that's it, right? Could you ever start with poodles on their own and breed back to wolves? And the answer is what? No. But theoretically, could you start with wolves and theoretically again get poodles? And the answer would be what? Y yes, exactly. Now, understand the account in the Bible concerning Noah's Ark. Two of every kind was to go on board Noah's Ark. So if dogs are all one family, and there are uh, two dogs on Noah's Ark. Then when they came off the Ark, uh, eventually they produce more dogs and you'd end up with a population of dogs, okay? But they're not gonna stay together. What's gonna happen is they're gonna split up and move to different places on the earth. And as they do, because the incredible amount of variability in the genes, eventually you'll end up with distinct groups, even forming different species. And now you're redistributing the information and you're losing information from certain groups. The opposite of evolution. Who's heard of the term natural selection? Yeah, well, natural selection, we observe natural selection. Darwin was right about natural selection. Who's heard of the term adaptation? Yes, well, adaptation is what's happening here. And speciation, forming different species. See, those terms are used in the secular textbooks to tell students evolution's true. Actually, when you understand natural selection, adaptation, speciation, it's the opposite of Darwinian evolution. It's evidence against evolution. The opposite of what's taught in most of the public school textbooks. Let me help you understand this further. Here are two dogs that have an S gene and an L gene. S for short hair, L for long hair, S and L together give a medium hair length dog, okay? So these were the two dogs, if you like, on uh, Noah's Ark. So they fall in love and they have offspring. And they have one that inherits an S gene from each of the parents. That one has two S genes. It's gonna look different to the parents. Does it have different information? Well, it's not new information. It's a new combination of information. But it's gonna look a little different because it's got a different combination. And then you might get one that looks like the parents that inherits an S and an L gene. And then there's one other combination. What is that? L and L. Oh, it's got something new. Well, it's got a new combination of information, but the information was already there in the parents. It's just the new combination of information. Now, the dogs move towards a cold climate. Those that have short hair and medium hair get cold and they die. And now you're only left with dogs that have L genes who on their own will only ever produce dogs with what? Al genes, they could never produce short hair or medium hair again. You, you form a different species of dog. That's a, that's a long haired dog. You get the idea? If they move towards a hot climate, what's gonna happen there? Well, those with long hair and medium hair overheat. They die. And now you're only left with dogs with S genes who are on their own will only ever produce dogs with what? S genes. And so over time, through natural selection, adaptation, what happens is you can form all these distinct species of dogs, but they're still 100% dogs, and they came from the original gene pool. Think about this, from a perspective of Darwinian evolution, 
you supposedly start with matter, no information, and over time, matter has to give rise to zillions of bits of information for all the information to build all the different kinds. So we should see increasing information all the time to build all these different kinds of animals and plants. Actually, what we observe is a loss of information, redistribution of information. It fits exactly with what the Bible would tell us. Actually, when we form different species, they actually have less information overall than the original, which means it's the opposite of evolution. This is evidence against evolution, and yet it's taught as evidence for evolution. And then you start to realize Noah didn't need anywhere near the number of animals on the ark that people think he did. He didn't need all the species of dogs, only two. He didn't need the African elephants and the Indian elephants and the stegomastodons and the mastodons and the mammoths. He only needed two of the elephant kind. And when the elephants came off the ark, again, just like dogs, over time you'll end up with different species forming, but they all come from the original gene pool and the incredible information that God put there in the first place. See how we can have answers? Isn't it easy to understand? Really is, makes a difference, helps you understand this. The Bible got it right about biology. Wow, because <laughs> it really is the word of God. Now, are you getting more excited about being a Christian? I hope so. Well, another question I get asked a lot is this. Oh, if we all go back to Adam and Eve, where did Cain get his wife? The Bible tells us that Adam and Eve had what? Cain and Abel and who else? Seth. And uh, the Bible also tells us Adam was the first man, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, that Eve was given that name because she was to be the mother of all the living, right? In other words, the Bible makes it clear there was one man and one woman to start with. And if you've got one man and one woman, even in Acts 17, verse 26, Paul says God made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth were all related. So we all go back to Adam and Eve, but then Genesis 5, 4 says, Adam had sons and what? Daughters. So originally, brothers must have married who? Sisters. Now people say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, even the Bible says brothers can't marry sisters. Not till the time of Moses in Leviticus. You see, Abraham was married to his half-sister and that wasn't a problem, was it? Not at all. Originally, brothers must have married sisters. People have the idea, oh, when you get married, you're not allowed to marry your relative. If you don't marry your relative, you don't marry a human. Then you've got a whole different problem. Right? It's just today, it's best not to marry a close relative. And you know why? See, the Bible helps us understand this and genetics helps fill in some details for us. Adam and Eve, when they were created, were perfect. But when they sinned, now everything's running down. God doesn't hold everything together perfectly anymore. He withdrew some of that sustaining power so things would run down, so we would die because we forfeited our right to live. And so because of that, over time, mutations, changes in our genes occur. And what happens is this, over time, each generation gets new mistakes and they get added to the next generation and they accumulate and get new mistakes. And so after 6,000 years, we have an incredible accumulation of mistakes. Now here's the problem today. Because we have so many mistakes in our genes, if brother and sister were to marry today, then uh, it's more likely that you'll inherit the same mistakes from your parents. And if sperm fertilizes egg and those mistakes get together, there's an increased likelihood of deformities in the offspring, which is why it's better to marry someone further away in relationship from you. So where you have a good gene uh, and they have got a bad gene, you know, the, the good gene will override uh, the bad gene. Now, here's, here's the thing. The further back you go in history, the fewer mistakes uh, that there would be. Adam and Eve had no mistakes. Their children had relatively few. Close relations could marry originally it wasn't a problem provided it was one man for one woman and that's what marriage is all about actually a brother and sister getting married originally is no different to a man and woman getting married today because you're marrying your relative it's just today you don't marry a close relative very easy to understand isn't it exciting when we get those answers and then one other thing, people say, okay, but then how do you get all the different races of people? Some people think that, oh, to get all the so-called races of people, God must have made different races to start with. Wait a minute. We're all descendants of one man and one woman. The gospel message is for every tribe and nation because we're all of one race, because we're all descendants of Adam. We're all sinners. And Jesus Christ became a member of the human race to die for the descendants of Adam. There can only be one race of people. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17:26, where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. 
It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 126 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children and those children had children and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark. And according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together, they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way, represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. It's very easy to understand. That's why you find instances like this. These twins were born in Australia, one dark, one light. These twins were born in England, one dark, one light. When we have children, you know, we have five children, they all look a little different to each other. You know why? They all have different combinations of genes. But it all goes back to the original gene pool. Well, another question I'm often asked. Well, look, you talked about Noah's Ark there, but is there any evidence for a global flood? You know, one of the things that I say to people is this, if if there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. By the way, do you know what we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. When I go to the Grand Canyon, I've been there with a park ranger, and you look down and you see all those rock layers and the fossils in the rock layers, and you see the big canyon there. I've stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon with a park ranger who said, do you realize a long time and a little bit of water did this? I stood there and said, do you realize a lot of water and a little bit of time did this? You see, because I believe the layers were laid down by the flood and the canyon was carved out probably at the end of the flood or after the flood. And of course, the park ranger would say, oh no, these layers were laid down over millions of years. It takes millions of years to lay down lots of layers. Well, no, that's not true. You know, not far from where we are at this conference, there's a very famous volcano called Mount St. Helens. And Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18th, 1980. Watch this short video. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, 
with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons, canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. and vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade. Similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. It doesn't take millions of years to form canyons, to form layers. And as well as that, I want you to watch this uh, short video here that helps us understand more about the canyon aspect. The Earth's surface is scarred by deep canyons, cut into solid rock. But how did they form? A little bit of water over a long time or a little bit of time with a lot of water. Modern rivers don't generally cut downward into the solid rock, so today's river erosion seems incapable of explaining rock canyons. The great flood of the Bible, however, provides a possible explanation for such canyons. In soft mud or sand in your own backyard, you can see the power of heavy rains on a small scale. A rainstorm can create miniature canyons in only minutes, Though these canyons are very small, cut into mud, they share many of the same characteristics as the world's great canyons. On a larger scale, mud flows have also been observed to form these features quickly. At Mount St. Helens, a single mud flow off the mountain carved Engineer's Canyon out of soft sediment in a single day, 100 feet deep. And the same thing even happened in solid rock. A series of mud flows created Lewitt and Step Canyons on the front face of Mount St. Helens, cutting hundreds of feet into solid rock over just a few years. We observe canyons being cut into rock today, but only by catastrophic processes. Just imagine how easy it would be to cut massive canyons during and after Noah's flood. Torrential water and mud flows, followed by uplift and heavy rains, created the right conditions to produce the world's canyons. Furthermore, it may have been easier when flood sediments had not fully hardened. Grand Canyon is a good example where we find evidence of catastrophic forces at work. Upstream is evidence of huge lakes. These lakes would never have formed if the canyon were already open below them. However, if these lakes had formed from rains after Noah's flood, and if the pressure of these waters broke through and carved through the recently deposited sediments, then we would expect to find surge deposits downstream. Below Grand Canyon, this is precisely what we find. Evidence of a lot of water cutting over a little bit of time. See, it doesn't take millions of years to form canyons, and it doesn't take millions of years to form fossils. At the Creation Museum, for instance, we have a fossil of a fish that was fossilized while it was 
eating another fish. That didn't happen over millions of years, did it? It obviously was covered very, very quickly, and there's lots of examples of that sort of thing. Uh, also, it doesn't take millions of years to petrify wood. Here's an interesting quote from a secular source. A few years ago, researchers at a national science laboratory in South Central Washington found a way to achieve in days what takes Mother Nature millions of years, converting wood to mineral, in other words, to petrify wood. And we read a statement like that, but I think many people don't think it through. You know, here they are saying, well, we found a way to do in uh, days what takes Mother Nature millions of years. Here's another way of reading it. We have found a, a way to do in days what shows you it doesn't take millions of years. <laughs> That's the whole point. It doesn't take millions of years. A number of years ago, we had someone uh, send to us actually a spark plug that was embedded in a rock. Uh, was that used by an ape man in his chariot two million years ago or something like that? And the answer is, of course not. It doesn't take millions of years to make rock. It doesn't take millions of years to make uh, fossils. You know, people often ask me about the ice age. Do you believe in an ice age? Actually, we believe in one ice age, but generated by the flood. The flood is the key to understanding the ice age. You can't just having a, have an earth getting colder and colder, everything would freeze over. Actually, you need something to produce warm water and evaporation and then to enable precipitation to build up the ice for an ice age. It's the flood that explains it. Watch this short video and you'll understand what happened. The ice on Greenland and Antarctica is in places miles deep and hundreds of miles wide. In the present, however, all but the edges of these ice sheets are cold deserts. Not enough snow and ice falls there to build up the depth of ice that we find today, even if long periods of time were available. The flood of the Bible may provide an answer. First of all, Flood rocks contain thick piles of lava and huge volumes of volcanic ash. Meteorologist Mike Ord has suggested that this might have led to the Ice Age. It, there's a lot of uh, uh, warm water uh, added to the, the pre-flood oceans uh, from the crust and also a lot of lava flows and volcanism that heat the waters. Evidence in fossils suggests that the oceans were warmed up in the course of the flood. The average temperature of the ocean is 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, after the flood, it could have been an average of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And you could have taken a swim in the Arctic Ocean uh, right after the flood, it was so warm. But then it's going to start cooling down, and that cooling is mainly by evaporation. So uh, the key here is that um, for that warm water, you evaporate so much more uh, water vapor in the air. As the oceans cooled after the flood, heavy snow began to fall. Computer simulations that begin with warm oceans show snow falling far inland over cool continents. Ice sheets build up thousands of feet thick where we see evidence for such ice today. This ice built up in only a few centuries of time. The whole process was sped up by volcanic ash cooling the earth after the flood. Yeah, because of the instability of the earth after the flood, there'd be a lot of volcanism. Aerosols are tiny uh, particles about a, a, a micron in diameter, and they'll float up there in the stratosphere for several years, and they reflect sunlight back to space. So you have a cooling mechanism. The ice is gonna build up, and then finally it's gonna come to a point where it's gonna peak. That's glacial maximum. Once the oceans cooled enough, the evaporation slowed, the snows stopped, and the ice began to melt. Calculations suggest that the buildup, movement, and melting of ice did not require many thousands of years as is traditionally taught. From a warm world at the end of the flood to the melting of the ice took only centuries of time. And then I see evidence of the one ice age and the short, rapid ice age that melts catastrophically. This is what I see uh, uh, based on science. Present climate is not the key to understanding what produced thick piles of ice in Greenland and Antarctica. It looks like the Bible had the key all along, the great flood in the days of Noah. 
See, if you, if you don't believe in the flood, you don't understand the flood, you won't understand the ice age. And there's another aspect of that as well. The Bible says there's never gonna be another global flood, which means we'll never have an ice age as we've had in the past. You know, isn't it incredible? The more, that you, the more that you study this and you start to realize, wow, the Bible's history about creation, about, about the flood and stuff, so, this explains the world. It does, it does. And science confirms it over and over again. Isn't it exciting? Well, another question I'm asked. Do you really believe that God created in six literal days? Even many Christians say, couldn't those days be millions of years? And uh, my answer is no, those days of creation could not be millions of years. And I'll tell you why. The reason is because, you know, any word has two or more meanings dependent upon context, right? It's context that determines meaning. For instance, the word day in English. If, if I said to you back in my father's day, that would be back in my father's time. If I said uh, you work during the day, you would understand that as a daylight portion of a day. If I said to you, we're here for three days, you would understand that as three 24 hour days. You know, the Hebrew word for day has similar meanings. The Hebrew word for day can mean an ordinary day, the daylight portion of a day, it can mean time. For instance, in the Bible, uh, when we read uh, in the day of the Lord, in the time of the judges, that's the Hebrew word for day, there it means time. But you know, there are rules of Hebrew that tell us when the Hebrew word, the word yom, means an ordinary day. For instance, uh, if we look outside of Genesis chapter one, if we don't use Genesis chapter one, whenever the word day is used with a number 410 times, actually, it always means an ordinary day. Whenever we have the phrase evening and morning in the same passage, 38 times outside of Genesis one, it always means an ordinary day. And whenever we have the words evening or morning individually with the word day, 23 times each outside of Genesis one, then they always mean an ordinary day. And whenever the word night is used with the word day, outside of Genesis 1 52 times it always means an ordinary day now let's look at the first day of creation you've got night evening morning number and day boy that gives me a strong hint doesn't it let's look at the next one evening morning number day 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 people it's so obvious from the Bible that the word day in Genesis 1 means an ordinary day in fact think about this for a moment where do we get the idea of our week from? We know where the day comes from, the rotation of the earth, the measurement of the day, the month, the earth, and the moon, the year, the earth, and the sun. Where does the seven day week come from? It comes from the Bible. That's where it comes from. It comes from the Bible. Now, some people say to me, yeah, but I read in the Bible that a day is like a thousand years. Who's heard someone say that to you? A day is like a thousand years. I tell people, oh, you mean that passage in 2 Peter chapter three? Yeah, read the rest of the verse and it says a thousand years are like a day. That just cancels that one right out, doesn't it? And not only that, it, the Bible doesn't say a day is like a thousand years. I want you to notice something. It says one day is, what's the next three words? With the Lord a thousand years or a thousand years are uh, as one day, you know what it's telling us? God is outside of time. To God, a day is like a thousand years or a thousand years like a day because God is not limited by natural processes and time as we are. In fact, in the very first verse of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, that's time. God created the heavens, space and the earth, matter. God created time for this creation to exist. He's outside of time. To him, a day is like a thousand years. That's not defining a Hebrew word. You can't use a phrase in the New Testament anyway to define the meaning of a Hebrew word. A Hebrew word depends upon the Hebrew language. Now, it's very obvious from scripture that the days of creation are ordinary days. I know there are many Christians that say that they could be millions of years or whatever, but the reason they say that ultimately is because they're taking what the secular scientists say about millions of years and trying to fit it into the Bible. And so, because of that, I'm often asked another question. Well, can Christians believe in millions of years? Now, if you believe in millions of years and, and you're a Christian, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that therefore you can't be a Christian, but I'm gonna say you're inconsistent. And let me show you why. We read in Genesis chapter one that originally, God told Adam and Eve to eat fruit. The animals were to eat plants. Uh, we weren't told that we could eat meat until after the flood. You see, originally we we're all created to be vegetarian. Um, remember what happened in Genesis. Adam, if you eat of this one tree as a test of obedience, you will surely what? 
die. It was Adam's sin that brought death. The Bible makes it very clear that death came into the world because of sin. Now, if you believe in millions of years and you believe the layers of fossils are laid down over millions of years and you've got all these layers of fossils with all these dead things in them, uh, then that doesn't fit with what the Bible says that originally all the animals were vegetarian. In the fossil record, you find evidence of diseases in the bones of creatures like dinosaurs. But when God made everything, he said it was very good. In the fossil record, you find fossils of thorns that secular scientists say are hundreds of millions of years before man. But the Bible says thorns only came into the world after man sinned. Paul tells us in Romans 8 that the whole of creation groans because of sin. You see, the Bible makes it clear death disease, thorns, that all had to happen after sin. But if you believe in millions of years as a Christian, you've got a problem because you've got all that before man. Millions of years before man, it doesn't fit. So you can't be consistent as a Christian and believe in millions of years and what the Bible tells us. So then the next question that people ask is, okay, well then what about the age of the earth? Isn't there evidence for, for millions of years? And how do we understand all that? Well, first of all, let's look at what the Bible says. If you take the days of creation as ordinary days and you take all those genealogies in scripture, if you add it all up five days before Adam, from Adam to Abraham, and then you add up from Abraham until today, you get about 6,000 years. Now, if the Bible said the earth is 6,000 years old, there'd be a problem because it was completed 2,000 years ago. So you see, the Bible doesn't say, here's how old the earth is. You know what the Bible gives us? A history, and it tells us about the days of creation, and when people lived and died and so on, and gives us that history so we can add up the dates, and that's how we get the few thousand years. I believe that Jesus made it very clear the earth can't be billions of years old. For instance, in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, Jesus said, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now, if the beginning was billions of years before he made male and female, that doesn't make any sense. But if the beginning was just a few days before he made male and female, that makes a lot of sense. Then people say, well, what about all the dating methods that seem to indicate billions of years? Actually, there are hundreds and hundreds of dating methods that you can use to age date things on the earth. See, one creation scientist I know makes this statement. He says, 90% of the methods you can use to age date things on the earth contradict the billions of years. Only 10% even seem to give the billions of years. But all dating methods have fallible assumptions. Who's heard carbon dating used to supposedly prove millions of years? Put your hand up. You know, there's a misconception out there in the culture. Do you realize that carbon dating has nothing to do with millions of years? It can't do. Any secular scientist who understands carbon dating will tell you the same. That's got nothing to do with being a creationist or an evolutionist. Carbon dating has nothing to do with millions of years. Nothing. In fact, Carbon-14, after about 100,000 years, uh, when you understand a radioactive decay, the half-life of, of carbon-14 is only a few thousand years. So after about 100,000 years, carbon-14, it would be not detectable. Here's how carbon-14 can be used. If something is millions of years old, it shouldn't have radioactive carbon in it. It should have all gone. Let me just do another example here of radioactive decay for you. This, this is just basic principles. It's so much more complicated than this. Nearly every textbook in science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old. And the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating or radiometric dating. Now, this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay. So if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? That seems like a lot. But let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version. Geometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped, and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life. 
that is the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore it cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science, because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom, and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand, and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said. You see, all those dating methods have problems. They're all fallible. There's only one infallible dating method, and it's the Bible. That's it. That's the only infallible dating method. And then one last thing is this. Why does it matter what Christians believe about Genesis? Well, here's the bottom line. If the Bible is true, and God's word is true, if that history is true, we have a basis for right and wrong. I mean, if there's no absolute authority, who determines right and wrong? Who determines what's good and what's bad? It's only if there's an absolute authority we know what's right and what's wrong. What's marriage? One man for one woman. Why? Because God made marriage. The first marriage, Adam and Eve, male and female. In fact, in the New Testament, when Jesus Christ was asked about marriage, he said, haven't you read, he which made them beginning made them male and what? Female. He quotes from Genesis, you become one flesh. He quotes from Genesis 1 and 2, talking about the fact that the doctrine of marriage is founded on Genesis. But if we believe, oh, no, the Bible's not true, we're just animals, we arose by chance, random processes, uh, there's no God, who decides right and wrong? We do. What's marriage? Whatever we want to make it to be. What's abortion? Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? You know what we see happening in America today? We see the collapse of Christian morality. We see increasing moral relativism. You know why? because increasingly there's generations who no longer believe that the Bible is true, its history is true, that God is the creator. They believe that man evolved uh, by chance, random processes. And so there's been a change in our worldview from a Christian worldview to a secular one. And young people, I, I just trust that each one of us here today has put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So many today, because of the teaching of evolution and millions of years, have been led to believe that the Bible is not true. And we need to go out there and tell them the Bible is true. The history is true. That's why the gospel based in that history is true.